Amen. Hey, I'm excited to be back. I'm excited to be back. Um, this past weekend in Roanoke, we baptized Dallas Martin, uh, which was such a, a pleasure, such an awesome thing. We have went to Roanoke for three years. We've had three baptisms. Amen? Amen. Amen. We've had three people come to know Christ while we've been there in Roanoke. Last year, it was Dallas's son, Jordan Martin. So in the last two years, we baptized a son and a dad. Amen? That's pretty awesome. So, uh, but this morning, I'm excited to, to bring, bring this message and preach this morning, and I'm excited for what God's going to do. I know we have one baptism today, and uh, I'm excited for that, and uh, we're going to celebrate with Peyton uh, what God has been doing in her life, and uh, just going to be an awesome day in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. I, I've entitled my sermon, The Steadfast Anchor, today, and we'll get there in just a second, but... A pastor was baptizing this young girl. She was probably nine, ten years old. And after the baptism, the pastor said loud enough for the parents and the congregation and everybody to hear. He said, little sister, by this act of baptism, we welcome you to a journey that will take your whole life. This isn't the end. It is the beginning of God's experiment in your life. It's the beginning of what God is going to do. We don't know what God will make of you. We don't know where God will take you, where God will surprise you, we don't know. But what we do know is that God is with you on this journey. Life with God is a journey, amen? It really is. Life with Christ is a journey. Life with Christ, when we were baptized into Christ, that was the beginning of the journey that we have with Christ. It's adventurous, amen? Like, it's not just a journey, but it's an adventurous journey with Christ, full of ups and downs. This journey with Christ could take us to the opposite side of the world. This journey with Christ could take us right down the street. This journey with Christ could take us to the tallest mountain, or it could take us to the lowest of valleys. This journey with Christ will take us Anywhere, Maybe this is why Jesus, when he called disciples, he didn't say, accept me. He said, follow me. Because it's a journey. It's a journey where you're going to have to follow God, follow Christ, wherever he takes you. Amen? You're going to have to follow him. Let me tell you just another story this morning. There's this elderly couple. They're, the man is 75 years old. 75 years old, and God tells him that he says, I want you to leave where you're at, and I want you to go to this land. And I wonder what was going through that man's mind when that happened. But, so he wants him to leave the land where he's at right now, and he wants him to go and take up his family and take up his kids and take up his wife and take up everybody that he has and take them and move them to a new land. And God tells this man that, this land that I'm moving you to, your offspring will inherit this land. The offspring that I am going to give you will have this land and it will be your offspring's land. Ten years pass, so now the man is not 75, but he's 85 years old. And him and his wife still have not had a child. Him and his wife still have not had that promise. God said, I promise that your offspring will inherit this land. And ten years have passed and, and that promise has not come true yet. That promise has not been fulfilled yet because they have not had a child. They were not blessed the way that they, as fast as they thought God was going to bless them. They were not blessed in that way yet. Ten years had passed. And one day the wife says, well, if I can't give you a child, why don't you have a child with this lady? If I can't give you the child that God says he's going to give us, then have a child with this lady. And the husband has a child with this lady. And of course, this does not end up well, right? This, this does not end up well at all. The wife eventually gets angry at this woman and this child and... The servant has to flee with the child that she has from the husband. Now the husband again encounters God and, and God once again promises this man that he shall have a son that will inherit the land. 
Finally, at the age of 100, this man has a child with his wife. Finally, at 25 years have passed since the promise that my child will inherit the land. 25 years. I'm 28 years old. I mean, almost my entire life has passed since the promise that my child will inherit the land. 25 years. At the age of 100, him and his wife have a child. Then after this son has grown up, probably 18 years old, I don't know exactly the age, after this son, this promised son, God, after 25 years, I finally have him. And now I've raised him for 15 to 18 to 20 years. So 45 years or so have passed since the first promise. Now God says, no, I want you to take your son and I want you to take him up on top of this mountain and I want you to sacrifice your son. Could you imagine the father? No, 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 no. That's not what you promised. You promised me 45 years ago that my son, my offspring would inherit this land. You promised me that my son would have this land, that I would have a son. And now you want me to take the son that you have given me and you want me to take this son to a mountain and you want me to lay him on an altar and you want me to sacrifice him? The father does it. And what's crazy is the son is old enough to see what's going on, really. I mean, the son is old enough to see this. He's 18, 20 years old. Some think he's even close to 30 years old. Like, he's old enough to see what's going on. He's carrying the wood with him up the mountain. Like, he's that old. He's that big to be able to do that. You know this story, amen? Right? You know this story. The story of Abraham and the story of Sarah. And the story of how God said to Abraham, you'll be a father of many nations. And not only will your son be blessed through you, but all nations will be blessed through you. And so now all of us who are in Christ, we're actually children of Abraham. We're actually heirs in the same promise that happened in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis chapter 22. Right? We're heirs to that promise. God said the world would be blessed through Abraham, not just his offspring, but the whole entire world will be blessed through him. The whole world. And God's promises are true, and amen. Right? God's promises are true. But it was, it's a struggle sometimes to, to stay the course with God's promises. Look at Abraham's life, 10 years in. 10 years in. He didn't hold on to that promise. He ended up having a child with a servant. And the reason why I tell you this story this morning is because when you flip to Hebrews chapter 6, which is where we're going to be, if you've got your text, if you've got your scripture with you, if you've got your phone on you, flip to Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 13. When you're in Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of the book of Hebrews just thinks that you know this story like the back of your hand. Some of you are like, I don't even know the back of my hand. What are you talking about, right? No, like he thinks you know this story. He thinks that you've been memorizing this story for your whole life because he's writing to Jewish people. But the promise in the book of Hebrews and and what this text says is for us today. And I told that story just so you would kind of get the background because this writer thinks you know that story already. And if you don't know that story, then go, in, go home this afternoon and read from Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis chapter 22. The, the Bible is this story from beginning to end. One story of how God loves you and wants to draw you near and wants to call you to him. And he, he's going to do whatever it takes to get you to him. That's the Bible story. You have sinned and you have corrupted all this earth. You've corrupted it all. But God still wants you and still loves you and still draws you. And he's willing to do whatever it takes. That's the story of the whole entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Go read Genesis 12 through 22. You got Monday off. What else you got to do? Read some scripture and read through this story. But so I told that story just to... Lay the groundwork for what Hebrews is going to tell us here. 
Let's flip to Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 30, 13. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, remember what's the promise? Promises, he's made this multiple times to Abraham. He says, No, I will give you a son, I will give you an offspring. But not only will I give you one offspring, I will, give, I will bless all nations through you. That's the promise, right, that he made to Abraham. And the writer just thinks you know it, right? He says, since he had no one greater whom to swear, swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. And I highlight the word promise in this text because that is the main theme and the main message for today. It's promise. Everybody say promise. You see, God promised Abraham. Promised him. He swore by it. And how did he swear by it? He swore by himself. Because God can't swear by anything greater than him. There is nothing greater than Him. And God couldn't swear by something greater. See, us as humans, when, you, uh, when somebody has to swear by something, normally we swear by God. <laughs> we make an oath by God. Or some of, you, some of you may make an oath on your mother's grave or whatever you say when you make a promise to somebody, right? You're promising on something better than yourself is what you're saying. And God is doing the same thing to Abraham. God is saying, I promise you have an offspring. And how am I going to promise it? I'm going to swear an oath by, I am who I am. Like you're my, I am the, the greater thing I'm swearing this oath by. This is why when people are in court, I hope none of you are in there and never have to do this, but they lay their hand on the Bible and they I say, I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me, God. God. Right? And so they're swearing by something greater than themselves. It's this oath they're making. And so God has made this oath and he swore by himself. He's made this promise and he's made this oath. That I'll bless you, Abraham. Not only will I bless you as one offspring, but I will bless all nations through you. All nations. You're going to have so many offspring, it's going to be like the grains of sand on the beach. And no, Abraham waited. And he obtained the promise. God has promised this to Abraham. And the promise came true. Amen. The promise that he would have a son. But not only the promise that he would have a son. But the promise that he would have an offspring in Jesus Christ. That would come and die on the cross. And then make Abraham the father of many nations. Through Christ. You see Christ is really the promised offspring. And if you're in a small group, you're going to see this in the book of Galatians. You're going to see this, that Paul is making this, this, uh, this line of connection. He's connecting the dots. He's saying, no, 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 the offspring that God was talking about in Genesis was not the naturally born son. But it was Jesus Christ was the offspring that God promised all the way back to Abraham. And now all nations are blessed through that. The promise has come true. Let's keep on going in the text. Verse 16. It says, For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all of their disputes, an oath is a final confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of promise the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath. So I want to stop there for a second. So not only did God promise... But God guaranteed it with an oath. See, his promise was twofold. He, he promised and he guaranteed it with an oath. This is something similar to what we do. Like God is relating to us as human beings today. Even though he is transcendent, even though he is greater than we, he, he's relating to us. Like you understand this in your life, right? When you make a promise... You also so, oftentimes make an oath or you swear by something greater than yourself. God is doing the same thing. I love God because he's relational. Like he relates to us. When we read through the, the biblical text, it's not as hard as we make it out to be. Like 
That's something to pick up. God wants to relate to you. So he's going to make a promise and he's going to make an oath just like you do. He does that. The thing about God's promises, though, is he has an unchangeable character, amen, of his purpose. Unchangeable character. God is the way that God is. God is love, is what the Bible tells, tells us, right? God is just, is what the Bible tells us. God is immovable. God is who he is. He is I am. He's unchangeable. He's amazing. He's a father. That's how he relates to us. God is who he is. He's unchangeable. And therefore his promises and his purposes are unchangeable because he is unchangeable. If I promise you something, that may not come true. Amen? Right? I am a human being who sometimes promise things that can never happen because we're people pleasers. Right? Anybody in this room not a people pleaser? Raise your hand. Okay, that's what I thought. Right? All of us. It's what we do in our lives. We make promises sometimes that are not going to come true. But we need to be, begin to let our yeses be yes. Amen, right? Like we need to begin to do that. But God's yeses are always yes. And God's promises are always true. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to get us to understand this. And he's sharing a story that everybody would know. This very same story I shared with you at the beginning of Abraham. Let's keep on going. Verse 19. Verse uh, 19, no, verse 18. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So there's two unchangeable things. Follow along with me. There's two unchangeable things. What are the two unchangeable things? What are the two things we've been talking about for the last five minutes, right? God's promise and his oath. Those are the two unchangeable things. God's promise is unchangeable. And therefore, his oath, which he backs up his promise with, is unchangeable. God is unchangeable, and his promises are unchangeable, and his oath is unchangeable. He does not lie. And therefore, we have strong encouragement. We have strong encouragement. Because God's promises are true. Look at this, verse 19. And I want to really stay in verse 19 this morning. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I really want to focus on verse 19. Look at those highlighted words. We have this as a steadfast anchor. If you're reading in the NIV, it's probably going to say something like, you have this as a firm and secure anchor. You have this as an immovable anchor. And many of you, if you're a little bit older than me, you're probably thinking, I know a song that's like, the anchor holds like this anchor is holding it's lasting it's secure it's firm it's going to stay put and the author of hebrews uses this great analogy actually the anchor is one of the most important themes in the early church probably don't throw me off the stage here the, in the early church the idea of an anchor was a more important symbol than the cross because the anchor holds them. And because they were going through so much hardship, they needed that symbol of an anchor to hold them. I really want to think about this idea of an anchor this morning. An anchor in ancient times started just as this huge, large stone or rock. It's this large stone or rock, and it would have a hole drilled through it. And last night I'm at home trying to drill a hole through this big rock because I got a. If you come to Owen County, there's a bunch of rock out there. I'm telling you, right? And so, so I'm trying to drill a hole through this rock and broke the drill bit. I'm done. No, I just put a picture up here, right? And so the whole point is this: that the rock is the anchor. In early times, this is how anchors started out. 
Just a large stone, put a hole in it, throw it over. Anchor the ship down. Anchor the boat down. Right? All of us probably have been on a boat before. All of us have seen an anchor. This is how they started out. And see, what's... what's this rock doesn't do the greatest job. You see, the rock can be as heavy as you want it to be, and it's still just going to do an okay job of being an anchor. Because if, if a real big storm or if a real big wave or if a real big wind pushes up against that, that rock has nothing in which to grab a hold of something. That rock is just heavy. Like it's just laying there on the bottom of the sea, of the ocean. It's just laying there, whatever lake, whatever you may be, it's just laying there. And see, that's why you begin to see this change in how anchors were made throughout history. So you go from this just a large rock, now you go to an anchor that has teeth. It's like a modern day anchor. It's like this, this thing that we see today. Right? And, and they begin to, to make these anchors to have what, what they call teeth. And so this anchor has, a teeth, has teeth now. It has something in which it could grab a hold of stuff down on the ocean floor, the lake floor, or the body of water that you're on, it's floor. And so the point is that if that wind pushed, or if that storm came, that that anchor would actually grab a hold of something and keep you where you're at. This idea of an anchor turned into what we see today. This symbol that we see today I actually saw someone, a Christian, not too long ago, that has a tattoo of an anchor. And it's this modern day anchor. It has teeth. And so this, this anchor adapts over time so that it will hold even better. But the idea the author of Hebrews has, it may be a large, just a large rock, but the point that he has is that anchors have purposes. And here, I just want to give you two purposes here of an anchor. And these, you're like, I know what an anchor does, right? But here's the point. An anchor is the stability of the boat or ship. Like it keeps the ship stable. Especially when waters, when in rough water or storms, it's going to keep that ship stable. All right? Second is this. The anchor doesn't allow you to go backwards, but it allows you to stand your ground where you're at in current. It allows you to stay put where you're at. So therefore, you don't go backwards to where you've already came from. And you can already see how this is a sermon in itself. The point that this author of Hebrews has for us today, the point that this author of Hebrews wants to make, go back to that text at the end. It says when it's a secure, it's a steadfast anchor. The point that this author has for us is that this anchor is going to hold us. And what is the anchor? What is the anchor that holds us as Christians, holds us stable in storms? In rough water, when winds pick up and the water begins to get choppy, what is the anchor that holds us in the storms of life? What is the anchor that keeps us where we're at when that water gets choppy? Jesus Christ. But the author of Hebrews is even going more specific. He's saying the promise and the oath. When God said, I promise I will save you and forgive you of all your sins, you know it's true. And I don't care if you go home and sin tonight. I don't care what the world may tell you. I don't care what in your mind these thoughts that creep in that say, I cannot be saved if I just did that. No, 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 no. The anchor is the promise that Jesus said, no, 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 I have forgiven your past and present and future sins. When you went under the water, you came up a new person and all has been forgiven. That's the anchor. That's the anchor. When sin creeps into your life and you begin to get rough and the storm comes, the anchor says, no, 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 no. I forgave you then. I still forgive you now. It's the promise of God. The promise is, no, you're saved. You're forgiven. You're justified. That's what Scripture would say. That's the promise. So what, what's the anchor next? What's the anchor now? What's the anchor when... What is the anchor when financial hardship comes? It's the promise 
that God doesn't care about your finances. It's the promise that God is going to take care of all of your needs. That's the anchor, right? When you have thousands of dollars of bills packing, st- or stacking up, when you have all this financial debt creeping in, God says, no, 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 no. Don't worry. I take care of the birds. You're more important than the birds. I will take care of you. That's his promise. Right? And God, God not only promised, but he, he, he makes an oath. And, and these two things are unchangeable. Because God does not lie. No matter how much you worry, the promise is still true. <laughs> no matter what. God says, I care about the birds. How much more do you think I care about you? No matter what PETA says, God cares more about you. Right? He cares more about you. He loves you. He will take care of all of your needs. When a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse and you're, you're going through a divorce and you're going through a struggle and you're going through identity issues like, I don't even know who I am. I, I don't feel loved anymore. No, no, no. God says, I love you. God says, I, prom- I promise I love you. And so it doesn't matter what anybody else may say. God's promise is he loves you. God's promise is it doesn't matter what somebody else may say. I have made you in my image and I love you and I care for you. It doesn't matter what magazines may say about your body image. No, God says I made you in my image. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that doesn't mean we just get to eat all, everything we want. That's not what I'm saying. Even though that's what I kind of do in my life. I need to change some habits, right? No, but no, no, that's, God says, no, 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 I love you. You're made in my image. The imago Dei, the image of God, is what you were made in. God promises that he is for you and he's not against you. So whatever comes against you, know that that promise is true and amen. That promise is backed up with an oath from God. That promise cannot change. When God says in in Romans chapter 8, I work for the good of those who love me. But you're you're looking at a doctor and they're saying you have some medical issue going on. God says, no, no, no. I'm working for the good of those who love me. That is my promise in Romans chapter 8. That is my promise in Romans chapter 8. That I will work for the good of those who love me. And that if who can be against us if God is for us? Who can be against us if God is for us? When God promises that he'll save you from your sin, yet you can't seem to beat that addiction, God's promise is still true. The one who's probably not true is yourself. You're not being true to who God has created you to be. When God says, I promise that I'll send my Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of all believers will help you and aid you and guide you into a sinless life, into a life where you can defeat sin and you can conquer sin. The scripture says, no, no, no. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I'm a slave to Christ. Amen. I'm a slave to Christ. Like, I'm a slave for Him. I'm not a slave to that sin that hold me in bondage for so long. I'm a slave for Christ. And God's promise is true. I don't care what the addiction may be. God's promise is true. When God promises you abundant life here on earth, when He says, no, I want you to have life, but I want you to have it to its fullness, you've only been given a few months to live. God's promise is still true. Last week, you baptized, while we were in Virginia, you baptized a man up here who had been given days to live, I believe. Last night, that man passed away. Last night, correct? Last night, I believe that man passed away. 
But God's promise for him, yet that he made last week to him, is true today, right now, in glory. Amen? Like, it's true. God's promise is true today for him. It didn't take him that long to see the promise of God. It didn't take him that long. It took him a week to see the promise that God forgives and God saves and that eternal relationship with God is true. That promise came true for him last night. I give God all the praise and glory that he was in here last week and got baptized last week. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for that in there. And so this writer of Hebrews, he thinks that you know the promise to Abraham. He thinks that you know the promise to Abraham. And he's writing to this group of people in the first century. He's writing to this group of people because they are going through incredible hardships. They're going through incredible hardships. And right now, at this point in the book of Hebrews, these people are thinking about turning back to, the, to Judaism. They're thinking about turning back and leaving Christ. They're thinking about turning back to their old ways because of everything that they're going through. And the writer of Hebrews is like, no. The promise of God is still true. Don't turn back. Remember, an anchor is there to stabilize you in a storm, but it's also there so you can hold your ground. You don't turn back. Just because life has gotten a little bit harder doesn't mean you turn back to the sin that you just left. Just because life has gotten a little bit difficult doesn't mean you go back to living that lifestyle where all the pains and things of life get drowned out by alcohol or drowned out by something else. It doesn't mean you seek physical pleasure and physical things. No, 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 no. God says, no, just stand your ground. My promise is true. It's true. This promise I've made is true. Doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. Actually, this, the author of Hebrews is very clear. These Hebrew people that he's writing to have went through some incredible hardships. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, this ain't going to be on the screen, but you can flip there real quick. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, the, the author says this to these people, this very same people, he just said this about the anchor. In verse 34, he says this. He says, for you had compassion on those in prison. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew you yourselves had a better possession and, a, and an abiding one. Do you see it? These very same people who are thinking about turning back. When they first came to know Christ, they were put in prison. And all their stuff was destroyed. And he says, no, you joyfully accepted the plundering of all your property. You joyfully were visiting other believers around you who were in prison. You were visiting with them and you were with them. You, you stayed the course through that hardship. And now you want to turn? No, no, no. God is the anchor. The promise is the anchor. The oath that he's made is the anchor. I don't care what comes against you. Stand your ground. Because the hope that you have and what God has promised you is an abiding one. It is going to happen. That promise still remains. That promise is still true. So I don't know who this message is for, for, for today. I don't know what you're going through in your life. I don't know every single detail about what's happened, going, what's happened this week. I don't know. But here's what I do know. When God promises something, it will come true. Here's what I do know. No matter what life throws at you, you must stay tied to the anchor that is the promise of God. That is the promise that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he rose from the grave, and that if you've believed in him, you have now new life. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. And not only that, but when you leave this world, you're going to be in eternity with him. And not only that, but after this whole world is ended, God is going to bring you and he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth and you're going to enjoy that relationship with God for all of eternity. This is the promise of God. No matter what happens now, that's the promise. 
That's the promise. Through all the hardship, through all the pain, through all the suffering, through all the medical issues, through all the financial issues, through everything, God's promise is true. And it's the anchor that holds us. It's the anchor that keeps us stable in the storms. It is the thing that keeps us from turning back. No, we stand our ground. And we actually go on the offensive. We're moving forward, amen? Like we're... That anchor is keeping us in the storm. It's keeping us stable. We pull it up and we move forward. We move forward in our relationship with God. We go on the offensive in the world when we go tell people about Jesus. So why when Jesus says, no, the, the gates of hell will not prevail. Why? Because we're on the offensive. We're storming the gates, amen? We're storming them. We're taking this promise, this good news, to everybody that we can. God's promise is true for you today. I don't know who it is. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what addiction, what struggle, whatever it may be. What sin is, is just controlling you. What a financial hardship you're going through. I don't care what it is. Remember the promises of God. Where do you find the promises of God? Right here. Right here. When he promises something, it is true. It's true for Abraham. Now, it may take 25 years. It may take 25 years. But it's true. Don't worry about the timing. Just stay tied to the anchor. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, right now, God, I give you thanks. Your promises are true. Your oath is true. Those two things are unchangeable. Those things hold us and anchor us and keep us stable in the storm. God, I believe there are people going through storms right now in this life, right now in this room. God, I believe there will be people who face storms this week and they can look back on Sunday morning and say, no, no, the anchor holds. It's secure. It is secure. Your promises are true. God, if someone's struggling with addiction, your promise that the Holy Spirit will help them overcome sin in this world is true. It doesn't mean they will never fail, but it means that you will help them to no longer be controlled, but to able, be able to control it. Father, you promise us that you'll give us these fruits of the Spirit. God, you promise us that you'll give us these good gifts. You promise us that no matter what life throws at us, we always have you, we always have a relationship, and we always have eternity. God, I give you thanks today for your promises because they are true and everybody said. Amen. Let's stand. As they sing, altars are open. I don't know what you're going through. Like I said... I just know God's promises are true. If you need prayer, I'll be up here. Others will be up here. Pray with you. Don't leave. Because we have a baptism of Peyton today for sure. Because God's going to make some promises to her. The very same promise God has made to me. Whatever you're going through, those promises are still true. Altars are open. Baptism is available. Find somebody and pray with them. Stand firm. Stay tied to the anchor. Promises are true. Amen.